update. And joining me now to discuss this and more out of the US is Peter Matthews, Professor of Political Science at Cyprus College. Peter, great to see you and thank you for your time. Well, news just in a short time ago, as we heard, the White House has confirmed that there will be a second summit between North Korea and the US next month. What do you make of this and what do you think we can expect from that? Well, it's kind of uncertain as to what the ground rules are, because, for example, the White House has been insisting that North Korea make and take an inventory of all of its weapons and what's left and where they're located, and they want North Korea to disclose that before the U.S. would even consider lifting sanctions. North Korea wants sanctions to be lifted, or partially at least, before they could even do that, and they're also concerned. North Korea is concerned that if they give away all of the location of all the weapons that they still have, they're worried about a preemptive strike that the U.S. might conduct on them. That's, you know, that's really what they're saying. And it's like a stalemate to a certain extent. But yet Mr. Trump is portraying it as having at least a very positive, you know, positive development. He thinks that um, we're on our way to nuclear, the nuclear free Korean Peninsula. I'm sure that's what he wants to happen. We all want to have that. But North Korea is not quite seeing it that way at this point. So are you not so optimistic about what the second summit might be able to achieve? Well, you know, it's always unpredictable when President Trump's involved. Now you have another person, uh, Kim Jong-un, who's also uh, similar in some ways, you know, unpredictable. But so we have to see what these men might come up with. You never know. All of a sudden, they come up with something. But in general, the way things are going right now and what both sides are demanding, it's very difficult to see a real full solution at this point. What the U.S. should do is take steps, the baby steps, for example, well, actually a significant step, to go ahead and recognize North Korea as an official nation, give them diplomatic recognition, sign a peace treaty with them, ending the Korean War. And that would be good steps in encouraging North Korea to start disclosing where its weapons are, and then a step-by-step -step dismantling can occur. Uh, so the question really is, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? That's a real problem right now for both sides. OK, well, looking at other news out of the US, and there have been claims that Donald Trump directed his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, to lie to Congress. There's talk now that that could lead to an investigation for perjury, even impeachment. And Trump denies this, of course. But what do you make of this? What's the reaction been like this, to this big story today? This has been a very extremely important and critical development. And uh, much of the people are seeing it this way today, and also as the media. Because what this says is that, and again, this is a BuzzFeed story, and the reporters claim that they have uh, spoken to uh, law enforcement officials who have actually worked on this case, as well as they claim to have emails and uh, text messages from within the Trump organization, uh, within the Trump organization as to what has occurred. And then what they're claiming, the, the reporters are, that President Trump uh, is alleged to have asked Michael Cohen, his attorney, to lie about when the Russian negotiations were occurring by the Trump Tower business. The Trump Tower was this big tower that was supposed to be built in, in Moscow for Trump, and he wanted uh, Cohen to negotiate with, with Russia and Russia interests. And Cohen, and, and uh, what's being claimed here is that Trump got Cohen to lie to say that this did not begin or end in January of 2016. We know what, the, instead, what Cohen has said is this actually the negotiations ended in June of 2016, much later, and the president always uh, dis disavowed any kind of activity with negotiations or business with Russia all the way as early as January. There's this big six-month discrepancy here as to whether or not what happened. And Cohen is saying that the president got him to lie for him. And if that's the case, that's considered the obstruction of justice. And that's definitely an impeachable offense. It's also a criminal offense, but certainly would be considered as high crimes and misdemeanors. Obstruction of justice charge could be what brings him down if this is proven to be true. It's still an allegation. Yeah, it is just an allegation. And of course, we've seen so many allegations come out in terms of Russian collusion, and yet nothing has stuck yet. Of course, we do seem to be ending, um, nearing the end of this Mueller probe. What do you think might come out of that? The Mueller probe is another very important one. That's probably the most important, because he's had so much of time now and so many resources. He's talked to probably hundreds of witnesses and people who were involved in the Trump campaign as well, other witnesses as well, who could corroborate certain claims. And so we don't know exactly what Mr. Mueller has, but in the very various filings that he's done publicly, it seems like he has quite a bit. So when this probe uh, summary is first got put together and then Mueller comes out and turns it over to the Justice Department, the Attorney General's office, the Attorney General has a chance to either give it to Congress, the committee in Congress, to be able to decide what Congress will do with it uh, or not. So there's a, still a big uh, consideration as to how this will go forward, even if Mueller comes out and claims in his report that the president violated the law, the campaign violated the law in any way. So it's, it's still up in the air, but it's coming to the end, though. 
Yeah, I think it's definitely coming to the end, and Mr. Mueller has some very powerful claims to be made, I'm pretty sure. Well, the shutdown is still continuing in the U.S. as well. I think it's into its 27th day now. Um, Trump and the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi continue their tit-for-tat war after Pelosi suggested that Trump reschedule his State of the Union address out of so-called security concerns. Trump has cancelled a military plane for Pelosi to fly to Afghanistan. This is an interesting um, development, isn't it? It's very interesting, but it's very uh, outrageous if you think about it, because this could have been solved a long time ago, just a few months ago, when what happened was both the Senate and the House passed a compromise piece of legislation that would have actually settled, uh, funded the government, a temporary funding with well, a continuing resolution, and that would have alleviated all the problem crisis that we have right now. And instead, and what they would have done then is negotiate and work on the border wall issue or the immigration issue later. That was agreed upon by both, and, they've, and there was some money put in, by the way, by the, by the uh, Congress, about $1.3 billion toward what President Trump wanted was $5.7 billion. So Congress was willing to compromise. Both houses passed this legislation, but the president last minute did not want to sign it, and that was because he heard from Fox. I guess some of the reporters in his uh, echelon of news people just condemned him, said, don't do this. This is a weakening of your position. And the president went back on that uh, possible solution. And that was a month ago. So right now it's been escalating. 800,000 American government uh, workers have been in tremendously terrible condition. Many of them can't pay their rent. Some can't make their house payments. One woman's about to lose her house. She has only one payment left out of her savings, and she has to sell her car, she said. It's very critical. Some people don't have enough money for their medical care, for co-payments, and some had, are going broke. They have to borrow money from their house to make their co-payments for their medical bill. There's other problems. We don't have a universal health care system here, but that's a different issue. And this is getting to be really bad to have an American government that 25 percent of it shut down some critical areas. TSA, which is the Transportation Security Administration, they are not, many of them are calling in sick. They're not inspecting the baggage coming in from outside overseas at the airports. We have uh, the um, people, the air traffic controllers that have been uh, furloughed. They're actually, they're actually working, but for no pay. So half the workforce that's been, this 800,000, about half of them are working for no pay, and the other half were kept home, but now Mr. Trump's calling them to come in and to work with no pay. Very demoralizing. It's almost a month now, and it's just a horrible situation that hopefully can be resolved soon with calm heads who prevail, hopefully will prevail. Yes, let's hope it can be resolved. OK, before I let you go, Peter, um, the Women's mm -hmm. March is going to take place again with um, women marching against Trump and many of his policies. This movement has been rocked, though, recently by accusations of anti-Semitism. What are you expecting to see this weekend? The Women's March was a very powerful statement when President Trump took office in 2017, January, when they had the march, the first march. There, were, there was a whole bunch of people there in Washington, D.C., and across the state, across the states, women and men, but especially women leading it, with a tremendous show of strength of progressive forces. But the scandal that you talked about, or some of the, you know, the consideration is, has to do with some of the leadership of the Women's March and the question about whether or not uh, that leadership, uh, you know, was supported in any way or attended a Louis Farrakhan rally and whether or not they would condemn Louis Farrakhan's anti-Semitism. So it's like a guilt by association type of claim. I would not discredit the Women's March because of that, because the vast majority of women in this Women's March and the men supporting it are very progressive, concerned people, very patriotic people, and they want social justice and equality for women and men, but especially for the women who are second-class citizens in America still. Women make only 75 cents to a dollar every, for every same type of job that every man makes, and that's just not right. Those kinds of inequities have to be addressed, and the women are out there doing it. And there's a lot of—it's uh, interesting, this last few—this election, for example, where many more women were elected than ever before, is an, it's a testimony to Women's March strength, the women in, involved in it, the men who support them. I just wish that there yeah. weren't some of the concerns that we see about the people at the top of this, which I do think is, is very concerning. But, Peter Matthews, I really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Carolyn. There are conflicting reports.